I now have the pleasure of introducing our next speaker, Charlie Ledbetter. Charlie is an ideas generator, strategic advisor to corporations and governments all over the world. He's also former Prime Minister Tony Blair's favourite corporate thinker. New York Times voted his idea of the pro-am economy one of the most innovative of the last 10 years. He writes regularly for the Financial Times, has written a number of books including Living on, Living on Thin Air, Up the Down Escalator, Why Global Pessimists Are Wrong, and his last book, We Think, The Power of Mass Cre Creativity, was published in March 2008. Charlie is listed by GQ magazine as one of the 30 most powerful men in the United Kingdom. So please welcome to the stage, Charlie Ledbetter. So uh, I'd like to uh, thank Daniel for that introduction and thank Dennis as he departs for that great presentation and for reminding us of the critical role of the ESSO World Cup coin collection <laughs> in economic theory and practice. Um, I have my own um, little yardstick of how bad things are. I know things are really bad when I woke up, wake up in the morning and I think, oh, it's really good that the house is warm, that the heating's still working. Something sort of as basic as that. Because I suppose it, when it starts touching things like that, that you do feel the economy is slightly worried, wobbly. I grew up, some of you may have grown up, but I'm a little bit older than most of you probably. I grew up when inflation was really bad. And actually all of the economy was designed to combat inflation. Now we're in a period where inflation just for a period will be good. But then it's a bizarre time, isn't it? Because I grew up when... LPs were quite expensive and water was free, and now water's very expensive and music is completely free. Um, so it's a kind of slightly topsy-turvy world. Um, and one of the things that's um, adding to that topsy-turviness is, of course, technology, where you can set up a UK tights company and it becomes a sort of global distributor of tights, uh, thanks to this weird thing called the internet. Um, I was in Florence last week, Friday, and uh, with a, in a meeting with a load of people, very important people in Florence, and they were very, very excited because Florence had just come out, they claimed, um, as the kind of top city destination for TripAdvisor. That was amazing to me that something like TripAdvisor could now hold so much cachet in a city like Florence that actually coming out top. TripAdvisor, I now use TripAdvisor regularly to wherever I go, it does seem to me that it's mainly Americans complaining about the size of European hotel bathrooms. <laughs> but once you get through that, it's quite useful. So let's just uh, start where, where Dennis uh, left, I suppose. Who here feels optimistic about the future? Oh, quite, this from most, almost 80%. Who here feels slightly pessimistic about the future? Quite three, well, not very many. Who here feels a mixture of optimism and pessimism? Probably a 25. Who here has got the slightest idea what's going on? <laughs> um, I mean, that's the problem. So uh, in order to do that and take a slightly different vantage point from Dennis's, I'm just going to give you uh, three diagrams which I think uh, might just help create a little bit of a map to have a sense of where you're headed and where in that kind of space you might be. Because I think one of the most difficult things, especially working in businesses which are so disrupted and affected by technology, is working out where on earth you are, who's doing what around you. So these are just three ways of thinking about the future. So this is the first one, how we talk and how we engage, how we communicate and how we engage with other people. And let me just uh, take you through it. Um, so there are two basic kinds of communication. There's high volume communication. That's the bloke on X Factor who says, Katie Wessel. That's high volume communication. And there's low volume communication, which is just sort of conversational. And then there's very engaging uh, communication and not very engaging communication. So uh, you can create a grid a bit like this using those uh, four things. So if you just think about that, that grid and where you might be, it's easy to see that uh, traditional, well, everyday life is down here. It's sort of low volume 
um, and not that engaging. Actually, a lot of blogging is down here. The internet has massively expanded the space for low volume, low engaging communication. Zero comments blogs live in this space. But this is kind of your average phone call on the train, which is kind of, you know, a bit of a kind of um, social chore, um, not very engaging and not very high volume. Uh, much of traditional politics is up here. Um, much of mass marketing is now up here. That's the, that's the sort of dilemma. You spend lots and lots of money, uh, you boost the volume, and actually you get no more engagement. Um, so most of the kind of traditional industrial era ways in which we communicate are in danger of going into this space. They're high volume, but not very engaging. So uh, where people want to be, uh, this, uh, one way of thinking about this is um, to think about French wine, actually. Um, so French wine, if you think about French wine not as a drink, but as a communication medium, if you think about it, um, it's, well, first of all, they give you very little information. They say, uh, I am Chateau Latour Lafitte, and I'm from a domain called Pomerel saint Estef, and I was made in this year, and that's it. Uh, that's all they tell you. They tell you the kind of volume of alcohol in the wine, but they don't communicate anything more than that. And they sort of say, the French wine bottle sort of says to you, well, if you don't understand that, you are not worthy of drinking me. Um, and anyway, where do you come from? Oh, God, you're English. I am going to be poured down an English throat. What a dreadful way to end my life. And so the French wine industry is built on a sort of communications classification, which is, I mean, if you know anything about it, just in Bordeaux, there's a different classification system on the left and the right bank. One dates back you know, 50 years, one dates back 150 years. There are, you know, fifth division chateau can be, uh, sell more than first division chateau. And then there are different wines within chateaus and stuff like that. And all of that is, there's absolutely no way you are ever going to get any of that clarified for you on a French wine bottle. Because the French wine bottle says to you, this is our language and we're going to use it. And if you can't use our language, that's your problem. So this is the language, really, of detached elites. It's the language of people who say, this is the language of this game. It's a kind of sacred ceremonial. And this is why the English kind of find wine so dreadfully threatening. Because when you go into a restaurant, you, you have to kind of go through that whole process of choosing, um, satirized by Michael McIntyre, where you kind of basically red, white, OK, you can make a choice about that. And then you don't want to choose the cheapest, because that makes you look really cheap. And you don't want to choose the most expensive, because you can't afford it. So you plump for something roughly in the middle with a nice sounding name. And then there's that dreadful moment where they ask you to taste it. And I have only ever seen an English person send back a bottle of wine once in a restaurant. And that was entirely to impress a girlfriend. So the whole kind of communication system around French wine is designed to preserve this opaque ceremonial, this kind of sacredness, this sort of sense of depth and kind of authenticity. And the reason why it's so um, vulnerable is that this lot come along. So if you think about Australian wine as a communication medium, Australian wine says, look, sit down. What are you going to eat? Um, OK, you're going to eat salmon. I go very well with salmon. I go very well with curry. Um, I come a place from a place called Margaret Bay Cloudy River. Um, I'm made of something that sounds like a girl from Essex. Um, uh, the, the date, you know, I was made in 2007, but basically that's irrelevant because every year we make the same wine. You can absolutely rely on us. And I imagine that you're English. That probably means you drink a lot of beer and a lot of tea and maybe some Coke. This is a bit like Coke. It's kind of quite reliable, <laughs> bit kind of soft and sugary, no complex tannins. You know, you drink too much, you get a hangover, but by and large, if you keep it simple. Anyway, just unscrew the top, sit down, and drink. And so the Australian wine industry, when, when it started, did not start by saying, oh, this is how you make wine and communicate it. You go to France and learn from the best. They set out by trying to do something completely different. And as a result, now uh, more people drink wine in America than in Europe. You can drink wine all the way around the world, and it comes from places like Australia, Chile, New Zealand, California. It doesn't come from France. 
So this, if you like, is the language of kind of populist elites. This is, we'll create a great product for you, uh, and it will be incredibly popular. It will use your language. It will talk to you in your way. You can use it however you want. We'll make ourselves incredibly accessible. So if you like, this is high, in, high volume, but high engage. It kind of is you know, projecting at you, but it's really engaging you because it's connecting to what you want to do. So in a different kind of way, this is this lot. This is high volume, high engage. This is Fox News is like fast food for news. It's kind of apparently looks succulent um, and it's got lots of sort of oil and grease over it and it's kind of full of sugar and you eat it and you feel full for about half an hour and then you need some more and so you come back. And the whole cycle of Fox News plus talk radio plus the Tea Party creates this high volume but high engage kind of politics which is now running Congress in the United States. Two years ago, the Tea Party completely dismissed. Fox News and the, the talk radio people, they were kind of dismissed as mavericks. Actually, what they put together is a political movement that is now partly running America. So this space is where a lot of people want to be. And you see it with politicians who want to get into the high engage, high volume space by becoming personas or having celebrity or charisma or what have you. Uh, this is the space of the sort of, this is Berlusconi. Berlusconi is virtually the best example of the sort of late 20th century, 21st century politician. High charisma um, and high volume, high engagement with some bits. This is the really interesting space because this is, this is high engage but low volume. And it's really engaging because it's low volume. So 600,000 mums on Mumsnet, no politician can now afford not to go on Mumsnet in the course of a campaign. No branding, no marketing, no celebrities, no big kind of shamaz. It's very low volume, but extremely high engaging because it's people talking about things that matter to them. So this is the privileged space of social media. This is when social media really works. And this is the space, actually, that you want to get into a lot of the time because the high volume, high engaged space is quite costly. It's very costly. It depends on brands. It depends on celebrity persona. This is a much lower cost way to get highly engaged conversations with consumers. So that's why we've got that shift. So how does that, all of that then, this is a way of thinking about how these spaces might feel in terms of the kind of sense of communication or the feel of the communication they enable. How does that change how we come up with ideas? So this is a way then of thinking about how communication changes how people generate ideas and how they share ideas and knowledge. So again, traditionally, um, we think that innovation comes from a few people. Innovation comes from clever people, um, designers in their studios, boffins in their labs, policy makers um, in uh, Whitehall. And it goes from a few people out to many people. But actually, one of the things the web is changing is that innovation can increasingly come from many people, not just a few. It can come from many sources. And that's a product not just of the web, but of the spread of knowledge and education around the world. And then you can think about whether the beneficiaries are few or the beneficiaries are many. And you put a grid together that looks a bit like this. Well, then you can see that actually a lot of uh, innovation has traditionally been down here. It's been about a few people creating something quite special for a few other people. This is highbrow culture. This is haute couture fashion. This is the high end of the travel industry. Uh, this is actually in a funny kind of way. This is social media in a way. It's a few to a few. Actually, much of the internet is not many to many. It's a few to a few. This is uh, people following dedicated blogs where you know, there are a few contributors and a few uh, recipients. But much of innovation has been around that space. And industrialization takes us up into uh, this space up here, right in the top, where you get a few people who create brilliant products that many, many people want. So in modern incarnation, this is Jonathan Ives and the iPhone. Beautiful, kind of irresistible, seductive products that are made at scale. This is Nokia, the world's biggest maker of mobile phones, where you get a few people who create things for, very, for many, many other people. But the interesting spaces, I think, are increasingly going to be over here, where there are many contributors. 
And the question is, will there be many recipients, many beneficiaries as well? So corporate open innovation programs, the likes of which Starbucks now have, My Starbucks, Dell, Dell's um, Ideas Storm, Procter & Gamble, increasingly trendy, which is there are many more ideas outside a corporation than inside. Let's create a big funnel and channel them into the corporation and find ways of engaging many people to help us come up with better ideas. So that's sort of corporate innovation programs that are increasingly common. Actually, in a funny kind of way, the X factor is in there. The X factor, one of the sort of genius of Simon Cowell is to see the business model of music, recording music, and see all its weaknesses and use those to create a new model. So it's costly to find talent, so we'll get them to queue up and come to us. Um, live is much, uh, more, uh, much more valuable than recorded, so we'll create a television program that has 11 weekends of interminable processional performances live. Uh, and then consumers are increasingly brand advocates, so we'll let them vote, and then they become the buyers of the, the goods themselves. So one of the geniuses of X Factor is that actually X Factor operates in many of these different spaces, in fact. It, in a sense, it goes from down here to the top right, where the beneficiaries, it goes from a few, Simon Cowell, out to a mass market. The beneficiary at the end is relatively few. The key beneficiary of all that activity is actually Psycho, um, Simon's company. So then up here, um, well, one question is, is Apple? Where does Apple fit? Does Apple fit here, or does it fit up here? Because Apple, I mean, I don't know, how, how many people here use Apple products? Good God. <laughs> It's a meeting of the cult. Um, <laughs> because, of course, going into any app store, Apple store, is like not going into a store. It's like going into some sort of religious shrine. Um, and the people selling those products with those T-shirts on, they aren't paid. They just love Apple so much that they want to bring us the benefits of the Apple way. Um, and the Apple's genius is to take this kind of rip, mix, burn, do it yourself, we're with you kind of stuff, and make absolutely shed loads of money out of it. Um, and make you feel great about it at the same time. The truth is, uh, the iPhone is not a really very good product. It looks absolutely beautiful, but as a phone, it's not terribly good. And actually, what they did was that they stumbled almost unwittingly on its great strength, which is the App Store. The real competitive advantage of the iPhone in the long run will not be the phone, it will be the App Store. It will be their marshalling of all that collaborative creativity. And in some sense, the App Store is just a platform of many to many. You can create an app and other people can and they can find their market. In another sense, it's many to few. Basically, all that collaborative creativity ends up funding Apple in some sense. But one of the appeals of Apple is that it is so kind of ambiguous. It plays in both those spaces. Is it with you or for you? Is it doing something to you and controlling you? Or is it doing something to allow you to do it by yourself? That's one of the dilemmas. But there will be many more opportunities, I think, up in that space. This is community open source. This is, in a way, this is Linux, except Linux is really few to many in some sense, because there's such a bunch of geeks at the middle of Linux. Um, but open source, open source culture, cloud culture in its generic form, Wikipedia, in a way, is more many to many. But these are the more interesting spaces, in other words. They will be where there are many contributors and either a few beneficiaries or many beneficiaries. Innovation used to be just about a few contributors. Increasingly, it's going to be about how you engage with Marshall, motivate, organize many. So what does that mean, then, for the way that we think about systems? Whether it's a booking system, or a corporate system, or a flying system, or a hotel system, or most of our lives are impossible to imagine without systems. Virtually every day, you know, time and time again, just your journey here this morning, you will have touched and relied upon huge numbers of systems that create commodified products and in very regular processes and protocols and deliver them to you, whether it's a flight or a hotel or a train or just flicking a switch to turn on the electricity, you rely on systems. But the other aspect of life is, modern life, is empathy. Let's put it like that, empathy and relationships. So um, it gives you this way of 
thinking about the world is that there are kind of low system versions of the world or aspects of the world and there are high system. And there are, if you like, low empathy experiences where you don't really connect with other people and there are high empathy experiences where you do. And if you put them together, you get a grid a bit like this. So this grid comes from a guy called Simon Baron Cohen, who is one of the world's experts in autism and Asperger's. And Simon Baron Cohen argues that autism is really the conjunction of these two continuum. And autism is really about people who can operate with high system but low empathy. So they systematize the world in all sorts of bizarre ways. They can see the world through prime numbers. They can remember, um, you know, um, plates on cars. They can do all sorts of complex calculations, but they find it very difficult to relate to people. So if you like, Asperger's and autism live up here. But how could we use that to think about the future of organizations, markets, consumer relationships, and an industry like travel. Well, just as a way in, let me give you this, which is a way of thinking about it through television. So this is uh, low empathy, low system. This is the world of Baltimore described by the television program, The Wire. There are no systems, there are no corporations because the market is too uh, fragile and poor. There are no public systems of law and order or welfare really that work, education barely works, but there are also very few relationships. So you can't trust your own family because they might shoot you in some sort of drugs heist. You know, it's a world, it's complete kind of anarchy. It's a kind of Hobbesian world, war of all against all. Um, so there are too many places, even in this country, which are a bit like that, where there are unreliable systems. Systems aren't really interested in you because you're not powerful or you're not rich, but there are also places which are bereft of culture, of social capital, and so on and so forth. So this is where um, you don't want to, to live. So up here, these are places where there are high systems but low empathy. So this is the world described by George Clooney's film, Up in the Air, where George Clooney plays a professional downsizer who flies around America um, acquiring frequent flyer points and sacking people. And that's all he does. And then he goes home occasionally to live in this awful flat. It's also, ironically, the world described by this great film called The Lives of Others, which is about an East German spy who um, kind of changes his life because he spies on some actors devising a play. But again, East Germany was high system, completely low empathy. The, the kind of similarity between these two films, one a picture of life in corporate America and one a picture in East Germany pre the fall of the Berlin Wall, is rather sort of staggering. But essentially, they're describing the same world. High system, low empathy. So this space down here is quite attractive because we quite like this. We like the kind of sound of it. And actually, during recessions, we like it even more because this is a world of low system but high relationships, lots of empathy. So this partly explains the success of Downton Abbey on ITV over the last six weeks because it describes a world as does Cranford, as does the Waltons, they all describe worlds before systems. No electricity, no welfare, uh, no telephone, no very little television, even in the Waltons. They're sort of pre-system, and so as a result, relationships are really strong. It's very nostalgic. This is very appealing, but actually it's not a world we could, or any of us, live in, because we all rely on systems, and increasingly on systems, which are about communications, data, so on and so forth. So actually, the world that we really would like to be in is not either in the top left, high system, low empathy, or the bottom right, which is lots of empathy but no system, but is somewhere up here. And unfortunately, the only films I can think of that symbolize that are science fiction films, sort of Matrix at times, but Star Trek and Star Wars. They are places where you have sort of empathetic systems. Systems that are capable of working with you, either because they understand you or they're designed to fit with your life or they're just simply invisible and so they don't interfere with you. But this is where the system is itself empathetic. It's capable of sustaining a relationship with you. So this is one way of thinking about the future of uh, organizations. It also might help explain the future of travel because bits of travel might fit into elements of this kind of world. 
So let me just see if that, oh yes. So that is the perfect example of a high system, low empathy uh, experience, uh, Ryanair. And everything that Ryanair does to other airlines around it kind of spread that toxin of Ryanair's approach. Sorry if there's anyone from Ryanair, but basically Ryanair is, here's the bargain, uh, you buy a ticket, very cheap, then we declare war on you. Um, <laughs> and um, we don't just declare war on you, we create a system that incentivizes you to declare war on your other passengers. So the entire experience is an exchange. Here's a system, low cost, and here is absolutely no empathy and you'll feel dreadful at the end of it. But if that's the cheapest way to get from A to B and that's all you want to do, that might be something you're prepared to put up with. So that's in that space. Um, down here is Alex Garland's The Beach, which is get away from systems, turn off your mobile phone, find that perfect island. This is the world ruined by Lonely Planet because no places like this now exist because everywhere has Wi-Fi. But this is the kind of search for escape, to get away from the system, to invest yourself in experiences which are real and relational, either with nature or with your friends. Uh, you definitely don't want to end up here. Um, this is a place where there's no system to rely on, uh, but there's no empathy. Uh, this is kind of, well, actually, this is, when, uh, this is when airlines really don't work. This is when you know they're lying to you, that your bag has definitely been lost, that the flight is definitely delayed, but they're still telling you that there's some technical problem and you're trapped in some um, distant airport somewhere and no one will tell you when you're going to get home. That's when you feel that you're in the grip of something that is neither systematic nor empathetic. It has got neither relationship or system. And then up here, well, the best example is the Chedi. Um, if you go to the Chedi, the Chedi hotel chain, it seems to be is designed, they design the Chedi, as far as I understand, from one very brief visit. Uh, they design the Chedi hotel so the staff have to meet the guests. So it's designed so that you're constantly bumping into people. And it's designed, of course, with lots of nice sort of social spaces which, uh, in which people can relate and do things. But there's also quite a lot of system underneath it. It's just quite invisible. And so that's an example of a sort of high system, high relationship, high empathy kind of solution. So I think that basically um, people are, uh, of course, uh, feel desperate about travel when they're trapped in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, they are prepared to go top left when it really makes sense for some sort of completely commoditized experience which will just get them from A to B. Um, often they want to end up in the bottom right, but actually the bottom right is a bit scary for us because when you're really beyond Wi-Fi or mobile signal, actually everyone gets slightly twitchy. Um, you know, maybe a couple of days, but you don't really... So actually, quite a lot of what people really value is, is up in the top right. It's high system, you can rely on it, it can connect you. You're not disconnected from the great big world, but it's also high on relationship, it enables that to take place. That, I think, is where the systems of the future will all be. So, um, final way of thinking about it. I mean, we have all grown up I think, with the idea that organizations do things for us. And that's a good thing. I, I love having things done for me. It's great to have people who will do things for you and you can pay them and they'll do something for you. But the danger with systems that do things for you is that they invariably end up doing things to you. And that's why people don't trust big corporations because they suspect at the end of the day, however much a corporation says, I'm going to do this for you, they will end up doing something to you. That's why I have a, a guy at Barclays Bank called a personal relationship banker. Now that phrase in itself should signal that he has no idea who I am. Um, and actually what he does is he calls me up and he, he kind of calls me by my first name and he tries to sell me products that I don't want, um, claiming all the while to have a relationship with me and he's doing something for me. So the reason that people distrust big organizations, public and private, is that in the act of doing something for people, they often end up doing something to people. And what people want, especially in high value added experiences where they've invested hope, money, anticipation, travel, 
is experiences that work with them, that they're not done to. And even if they're done for, they're done with. And sometimes they can do it by themselves. So think with and by, not just for and to. And don't think just system. Think systems that support relationships. And those, I think, will be the successful recipes of the future. Thank you.